think we're recording now. Okay, Gretchen, are we are we ready to get started? Let's go for it. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining our faculty professional development training today. It looks like we've got a great turnout. Appreciate you coming. Uh, I am Dave Allen. I'm the Senior Director of Learning Design and Educational Technology, and I'm the head of the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning that is co-sponsoring this faculty professional de development with Gretchen Heaton and her team. Uh, I want you want to let you know that we are so happy to be able to co-sponsor this because digitization and e-portfolios are an important, innovative, both pedagogy and technology. And so as the CITL, that is definitely uh, in what we love to work with. So so I've been really happy about that and, and enjoyed our collaboration, of course, with Gretchen and her team. I will be monitoring the, the chat during this presentation. And so if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to post them in the comments. And I'll try, I'll be keeping an eye on that and trying to bring those questions forward as we can. I'd uh, like to thank Jeff Yan for joining us today, the CEO of Digication. Really appreciate you coming, Jeff. Appreciate your time. And now I will turn it over to Gretchen to introduce Jeff. Um, thank you so much, Dave. Um, and I, um, I am just so thrilled uh, to have Jeff Yan with us uh, today. Um, he is the, as Dave mentioned, the the CEO of Digication, but he's also the creator of Digication. Um, and he's quite simply just a really fun person to talk to and a person who knows a lot, a lot about pedagogy. Um, and I will say that um, when we were looking at um, platforms as a committee, one of the things that we really loved about Digication, among many other things, was the emphasis they placed on pedagogy and making sure that this was a good experience for students and faculty alike. Um, so I know that Jeff will talk more about that. Um, in his presentation with you today. Um, I wanted to make just a quick announcement. Um, uh, I'm not sure if Jamie Van Zetten is here yet. There's so many of you I can't see, but I don't know if you saw the email I sent out. Um, Jamie Van Zetten, who is currently the Assistant Director of Advising um, for the American Women's College, um, has just recently accepted our ePortfolio coordinator position. So he is really going to be um, your main point person, yes, um, your main point person at the university for all things digitation. Um, and his, his skill set is just, he's just a perfect fit. There's Jamie, I see him. Can you wave, Jamie? Um, so he actually starts his position on November 14th. Um, but I just wanted to, to make sure everybody is aware that he is coming on board. So um, I wanted to give you just a really quick bio of Jeff before I hand things over to him. Um, so Jeff, uh, Jeff Yen uh, co-founded Digication with his partner, um, Kelly Driscoll, while they were teaching in the architecture, digital media, and education departments at um, the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, additionally, he was the director of, of a digital media program at Rhode Island School of Design, where he managed its curriculum as well as its accreditation process. And this is, I love this bit about his bio. Many of the company's beliefs about education are influenced by the inquiry, discovery, critique, and showcase-based pedagogy that Ian and Driscoll experienced while studying and teaching at RISD. Um, and Jeff, today we'll be talking about why he thinks ePortfolio is such an important educational tool, and we'll be highlighting um, some innovative ePortfolio practices around the country. Um, and as we mentioned, we are going to be monitoring the chat for questions, and there will be time at the end that we reserve and set aside for questions for Jeff. Um, so if there, Jeff, do you have any questions before I hand things over to you? No, uh, that was a, such a great introduction. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, and the floor is yours. All right. Well, um, hi, everyone. I am so honored to be here. Uh, I, um, I will be sharing my screen at some point, but I hope that you uh, might enjoy that. Uh, this is not going to be a presentation with a lot of slides. In fact, I have no slides. But I will be sharing my screen later to show you some examples of portfolios and and um, things that I think you might find interesting. Uh, but I, um, I want to tell you just a little bit about where, where this all came from. 
uh, when I was a um, when I was young, I um, I grew up in Hong Kong, and uh, and at the time it was still a British colony, and um, and we um, the education system was really weird even for me as a child. Um, I remember that first of all I didn't speak very much English at all when I was a kid and when I was growing growing up in Hong Kong. Yet the majority of our like school materials were in English. Our math class is in English. Our history class were in English. Geography class was in English. All the sciences were in English. Actually, the only class that was not in English was the Chinese class. Except that, guess what? None of our teachers really speak that much English either. So it was um, essentially a number, you know, uh, most of the teachers were non-English speakers leading and all the students that are also non-English speakers, but all our textbooks were in English. And um, so for us, schools, school means that we, we would um, memorize a lot of letters and words that we didn't know. We didn't have a way to even write. The, if you understood a concept, you know, you couldn't express yourself. You couldn't say what you mean, even though you understood it. If an exam question asked you, what's the point of X, Y, and Z, and you knew the answer, you couldn't write it because it's in English. We couldn't do it. And so the only way for us to do well in the exams were that we, we would memorize everything that were in the textbooks. So if the textbook had said, this is the point of X, Y, and Z. You better memorize the paragraph exactly as is. Um, and um, because otherwise in the exam, if you, you know, answer the question, but you missed, you know, some words, it is very likely that the sentence didn't make any sense anymore. And our teachers didn't know enough English to know how to correct it. So they simply just will mark, take, take, take points off of your, 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 your questions until, you know, such point that your, your exam, you know, you would, you would fail it basically. And so that was sort of early part of my education. And um, I, when I was about um, 13, 13 years old, I was the most unhappiest student that you can imagine. I, I, was, I was so angry at that system. I was so angry at the way that they were teaching us and that I felt like it was such a waste of time. And then I somehow found a, um, a brochure on, at the school. That was a brochure about a school. Um, uh, there was actually several brochures that were boarding schools in England that were there to recruit students to go. And I, f I picked up one of those and uh, I wasn't even sure whether I was supposed to take them to be honest with you, but I took one of those. And that night I went to my parents and I said, I'm going there. And I, I don't know what it says about me as a child, but my parents were very happy for me to leave. <laughs> and so they, they let me go. They said, you can go. And um, very fortunately, I ended up being in this boarding school in England and turned out to be in just a really incredibly different experience. And I remember going to my first history class and to my first history class. And the teacher said, we are going to give you this bag and this bag had all kinds of evidence and you are going to solve a crime. And um, in this bag, there were, you know, little newspaper clippings. There were little artifacts. There were, I don't remember all the things that were in it, but I remember thinking, this is what we do in history class. That's crazy. Um, so we don't have to memorize names, dates, events, and paragraphs of word long words that I don't understand. I, do, I couldn't pronounce any of them. 
I remember hearing, you know, we had to, we had world history in Hong Kong and, you know, like there were all these words that I didn't know how to pronounce because they're in English, they are very long and they didn't make any sense to me. I didn't even know whether something is a name of a person or name of a city. And yet going to this, this first history class, the, the, the teacher, his name, his name was, was Dr. Ford. <laughs> That's his, that's him. And he, he was as, as British as it gets. And he gave, gave us his bag. And I thought, wow, this is what learning looks like. And that started me on the whole journey of thinking about education and pedagogy. Um, and it, it was something that I, I don't know whether it's a silver lining of all of this. Is it just something that I didn't take for granted? It's something that I've experienced that version of it where you don't get to be a learner. Um, and, then, and then you did, and then you go, wow, that's really cool. And you get to put together things and you put together ideas. And if you have thoughts, you can express yourself. There wasn't really a right answer. You can say these, you know, this piece of evidence matches that one and you can, you can make up your own mind. And I thought, wow, what a privilege, what a privilege. And, and um, and then later on, after that, I had a I have a fabulous experience, um, you know, there. And then and then I um, ended up going to school in the U.S. and I went to Rhode Island School of Design, um, as Gretchen had mentioned, and I um, it's um, it's pronounced uh, RISD. Uh, and for those who don't know, it's a small art and design school in in Rhode Island, and and um, I I love this I love the my experience there perhaps even more. This is where a place where you know the students were so so creative. In fact, I'm going to share my screen a little bit, show you some images that I think will help illustrate this point a little bit um, with you. So I'm going to share my screen, and um, I threw these into a into a portfolio page. Um, Again, I told you I wasn't going to show any slides, so there's no slides. Um, and um, this is the campus. It looks like a lot of campus. It's pretty. Um, this is the kind of culture that the school has. This is our official map, I think, at the school. Um, and um, and uh, what we do is we have studio spaces. See this? So this is um, what a studio looks like. This is one of many, many studios. So since, you know, thinking a lot about teaching and learning and since going through this program myself, I was trained as an architect. Um, we started thinking about this thing where we call, we call it studio-based pedagogy. And when we talk about studio-based pedagogy, what we're really talking about is, um, it really is a, a number of things. First of all, is the space itself. So you will see that I'm showing here a space and you will see people have very messy spaces, but they're all in one open room like this. People are walking around all the time. You will see this person's facing one way, this person's facing another way. They get to see each other's stuff. They get to see what's going on at real time as things happen. So if this person in the plaid shirt is building something or making something, the second that it exists in the world, that that person next to him probably already see it, right? And you also see that the good stuff, but also all of the, the failures, all the things that didn't work, all the things that look terrible, right? And it looks like that. As these students are pr producing these beautiful work here, that other student that are walking around get to see it and they get to um, learn from it. And what they do is that what they really do is they they talk about it. They come around and and they go, what are you up to? This is so cool. They give you feedback almost like instantaneously. 
that was something that I never got when I was in either, you know, my education experience in, in, in Hong Kong or in England. So in England, I, I really felt like there was a really fabulously put together curriculum and the teachers, you know, were so caring and really thought so much about, you know, learning and, and sort of, a, but more of a conventional sort of more sort of, you know, pedagogy that you would experience in, you know, with a textbook. Um, obviously, that history class was a little bit of a, um, you know, exception. Uh, but in this environment, what was so interesting, I remember thinking as a freshman in this class, and you see what these students are doing here with all the easels and drawings on the, on the floor and on the wall. Um, this is what we call the Freshman Foundations Program. And this, in this program, um, we no matter what major you're going into, you have to take this drawing class. It's, you have to actually take two semesters of drawing class. And these are really intensive courses that you have to take and you just draw all day um, and um, many times all night because we, had to, we have so much work that sometimes, you know, we, we end up pulling a lot of all-nighters to this work. But what we do is that we, there, there, isn't, a, there isn't a book on how to draw. I've never seen throughout my, my program at RISD, I've never seen a textbook on how to draw um, or how to paint or how to build something. Um, I was studying architecture. I've never had a textbook that says, this is how you create a door and or a window. Um, we did have reference books. I would take, take that back in that, you know, on the sort of professional side, you get to have these almost like dictionaries on like how windows are put together, but we didn't study those. Um, they were more for, you know, just so we know how to look up, you know, how to buy a product basically. But we never, we never, had, we never had textbooks like that. And, um, and the idea though, like if you think about these folks drawing here, what they were basically saying is there are so many millions of iterations of ways and possibilities of you doing something that our teachers, our curriculum had decidedly said, well, we're not going to have something to teach you. We're not going to have something that's simply say, well, if you can do these five things, then you've graduated this course. Oh, you are, you've done well. They actually really just couldn't do it. There were too many possibilities. So as a result, and by the way, this is what you will find in a lot of the arts. As a result, what we did was we allow, we set up a premise and we allow students to express themselves. We allow them to express themselves, but then we will go into critiques. During these critiques, what we will do is we let them tell the stories. We let them tell us their journey on how to make a decision from point A to point B to point C. But some people don't do A, B, and C. They do A, D, and F, and then to a letter, or and then to a number. They might go in very meandering paths. They might go in directions that we never expected. This is exactly what I meant by we didn't have, we forget about having the answers to them. We didn't have the questions to them because they are in charge of asking many of their own questions. What we get to do is when they ask their questions, we help them guide them to define their questions better. We help guide them to figure out, well, you know, have you have you thought if, if you thought about this question, have you thought about another question that is similar? Um, we get to do those things. So this is what critiques look like. So we sit around, it looks like a really sort of a fun. Um, but it looks like you're having a you you're in a party. It looks like you're in a cocktail party, um, except we're not. We're very serious, and and um, people will present their work. So on a weekly basis, we typically have to present our work. I don't know, um, two to three times maybe, um, formally, uh, meaning those are the times where you're presenting to um, either formally to your professor or maybe a small group of people that is in your class. And sometimes it's to an external group of people that your professor would have invited to come to your class. And they are called guest critics. And we would all have all kinds of guest critics coming in. The guest critics sometimes come from different departments. Sometimes they're people from, you know, in the, in the field. Um, they would come in and give the, provide the feedback in the, in, in the critique. 
And the art of doing the critique themselves are really difficult, in my opinion. It took me many years to try to figure out how do you ask critical questions? How do you how do you even figure out the point of someone else's problems? So this student who might be talking about this particular drawing, um, you know, you can look at it with your own lens, but you have to figure out what is their angle, what is their lens. Um, and then you have to put yourself in their shoes and try to figure out, well, what kind of questions is worth asking here? So at, at RISD, we have this thing um, that instead of, um, I know that a lot of a lot of us, you know, in in um, in in learning outcome in learning outcomes, um, you know, talk about critical thinking, which obviously is a is a wonderful um, is a it's a, it's a it's a wonderful way of you know um, you know seeing how our students are uh, are becoming critical thinkers. And in, at RISD, we 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 actually ended up. I didn't participate in this particular project, but um, the school, the, at the time, the uh, um, the provost and the number of faculty members wrote a book called Critical Making. And it really is an idea where we want to encapsulate that in order to solve problems, we have to also be able to ask critical questions. And if your faculty member are the one who are always asking and defining what the critical questions are, then the students don't get the chance to ask those critical questions. And that was a that is a really key part of some of the things that I I really believe in. And I think that it's really important. And so this all of this will have a lot of influence to how and why we build education later down the road. Um, this idea of students being able to express themselves and they get to ask their own questions. And I think that many of you by now would have translated that, well, some of that translated into things like reflections, may have translated into things like um, um, being able to provide feedback with each other, being able to express themselves. Um, for us, there is something maybe a little bit more to just a very format of being able to showcase things to each other. So this idea of make learning visible for us, it's is make learning visible, but that learning isn't, you know, like how I did in an exam visible, but it's really the things that I create, I crafted, I, 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 I made alive. It's something that didn't exist until I came along. And I think that that was something that for us was a really powerful way to engage students. And by the way, we extend this. And some people say, well, yeah, you're in the arts and this makes a lot of sense. You have all these tools to make things and make beautiful objects. And therefore, it, it just makes sense. And I, I don't think it's necessary true. And then later on, I will show some examples that I think will, will counter that. But even before I show those examples, I would I would really very much argue that if you, you know, it may also just be the format in which um, your class may take place, the, the, the format in which you allow students to express themselves. So if self-expression becomes a, an important part of learning, then I think it might drive you to think differently about, you know, how you structure that class. And, and for us, um, this is, this is what, this is, this is the results. And of course, we benefited from many decades of people before us who have come up with these formats and, and had refined, you know, the curriculum so that we, we know where the boundaries are. We know, we know sort of, you know, fairly well how many questions we should post before they get to also, you know, do their own questions. So it's not open-ended, like, like it's not, it's not completely open-ended, like they can do anything. Um, there are um, definitions, there are boundaries, and we work with them, but we also try to figure out when it's a good time for them to break them. So we oftentimes, one of the most beautiful things that happens almost on an annual basis and it's happened to to me as well when I was a student going back to this freshman year 
I was a student and um, and we would, aside from the drawing class, we have something called a 3D design class. And so, you know, it's more or less like a sculpture class, okay? So we have to build three dimensional objects. Um, and um, every single year this happens, we will come to the class and then one or more students sometimes will come to the class and none of these students would, sometimes these students would have never had built anything before, right? They, they might have had a lot of experience with drawing or painting, but they may not have never built something in three dimension. That's very common. Um, they will come to the class and they go, well, where's your work? And the student would go, well, here's the problem. I took the work, I start, I worked on this really hard. I built it in my room. I, you know, I, it's, I, I, I worked on it a lot in the dorms. I pull an all nighter. Just before I was coming to class, I realized that my work doesn't fit through the door, which is hilarious because we go, well, so there are two ways to look at this. Some people would go, you should have thought about that. But then the other people would go, because you didn't think about it, you just created something potentially really extraordinary. So in those cases, this is what our professors would typically do. We would go, all right, well, when it's your time, you know, for your crit, we're gonna come to your dorm. So we'll march over across campus to this person's dorm room and we'll you know, all gather into this tiny room with 20 people or 15 people and look at this work. And sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes you're like, wait, we walked all this way for nothing. But sometimes it's just amazing. People build these things that are like, well, because we didn't tell them the limit that it must fit through the door. So they didn't get to ask that question. So they didn't ask that question. And so they let themselves express themselves in ways that wasn't expected. Does that make sense? So for me, those are beautiful, beautiful learning moments. In some sense, I would say that that student will never ever build something that they can't fit through the door again. But on the other hand, having that experience in your repertoire, it's something that you learn you know, really differently. Uh, you, 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 you really take that kind of level of, you know, questioning. Um, you don't take these things for granted. And I think that's really important for us as we think about, you know, pedagogy. We like to look at these little minute little things and we pay close, close, close attention to them. Um, so this is a shirt that we officially sell at our bookstore. Um, called Crit Happens. Um, and, um, and this is the culture that we have at this school. So now that I've shown you a little bit of the sort of, you know, the origin of, of where a lot of these things come from, what I'm gonna do now is I wanted to show you through a number of examples, um, through a number of examples, ways that people are using digication. And I will comment a little bit on, um, some of the, the things that I find interesting as well, um, because I think there's a lot of innovations going on um, around, really around the, you know, around the country. Um, the very first example that I wanted to show is a portfolio created by a student um, in University of Alaska, Anchorage. Um, her name's Amanda, and um, Amanda is a uh, native Alaskan. Um, as a native Alaskan, she um, she um, uh, has created this portfolio, and you can see this portfolio is fairly typical, by the way, of a lot of portfolios where it's really sort of a a very extended profile and highlights of the kind of things that Amanda, you know, about Amanda. And she gets to express herself this way. And, and she has a, a page called About Me. And, um, and she um, has photographs about her, her family, um, her early lives and her athletics abilities and, 
and, and, and education goals and so on and so forth. And also a little bit of her passion about working with diverse individuals. But something that I didn't know until um, I learned more about the native Alaskan culture is that when a native Alaskan introduce themselves, um, instead of just saying, hello, my name's Jeff Yan, what they do is they oftentimes will talk about the place where they're from and sometimes the place where their parents are from um, and the village that they're from or the, the tribe that they belong to and the name of their parents and what they do and to give you a full context of who they are. So in this case, this is why it's not a surprise now that I've known that, that she said this is who she is, but you can also see her mom, her dad going fishing, her grandma, brother, um, and, um, and you know, her family. Um, it's actually an incredibly important aspect of how um, in this culture um, they introduce themselves. And, and we have to make room for, for that. And this is another reason that we at Digication create, and I'm sure that um, through Gretchen and her team's hard work, you've seen probably many templates and, and, and the ability to scaffold that experience for students. But you will also see that in Digication, we do not provide a way for Gretchen or for you to lock down a template for the students so that they must not deviate from the, the structure that you created for them. And this is the reason, because we want the students to have the ability to express themselves, because that is critical, that is important. And without the ability to express themselves, without the ability to really, you know, to, to really feel like that, that they can be heard, be seen, be recognized, how could they possibly get a sense of belonging? How could they possibly get a sense of self in, in how, you know, how they um, exist in this community? And so for us, this is, you know, it might just be a gesture, but it's important. You will see other gestures that we put into education as well, by the way. And some of you may notice it. Some of it, some of you may might might have just experienced it. Um, one of the things that we do is that students get to create a portfolio, and by default, you don't get to just see it. The students are the ones who grant you the rights to their work. It is by design, it's deliberate at education, because we think that students need to know just through that really tiny little thing where they get to publish and then decide who gets to see their work. It's because it belongs to them. That work is theirs and they're not at the school to work for you. They're there to work for themselves. And that I always feel this way and I don't, I hope I don't offend anyone if you don't feel the same way, but I feel that when I was teaching that I got the privilege to be part of these people's lives and they are willing to share their creations with me. Um, I always thought that that was such a privilege and that, you know, that they were willing to put the, the trust in the, to, to, to be, to have the, 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 be so willing to share that with me. I felt like that that was a privilege and and I, I feel like that sometimes in a more, you know, conventional classroom environment, um, we don't go in with that sort of mindset. Sometimes, you know, in, in fact, in some cases, I think that sometimes, you know, um, uh, the opposite, you know, is true to power dynamics and it's in such that the students are going in, in a class saying that I'm so privileged to be here to be taking this professor's class. Um, I just never had that. And so therefore we built education in this way. Um, and, and so um, uh, I, I think that, you know, there is something really 
beautiful about students having the, you know, the, 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 you know, having that ability to share with you specifically. And so anyway, this is, this is this page. And of course, you know, she talked about a lot of other, other pieces, you know, about herself. And then if I were to go to the next one, which I, I love, absolutely love this page, it's called Drawing Connections. In here, she talked about defining my passion and she write about how in Alaska, this is a pretty well-known fact that in Alaska, the um, uh, rate of um, uh, sexually assaulted um, cases is way higher than the rest of the country, especially of the Alaska native um, populations. And for her, um, this has is something that she grows up with. She doesn't just read about it in the newspaper. She experiences it. She knows what this is like in her community. And for her, this is how she's making, starting to make connections. This is a problem that she, in her mind, it has to be solved. It's an issue that needs to be addressed. And so she had created this vision for her to do that. And she started taking classes about family laws. Um, she started um, working on um, she working on projects and taking classes to to be able to do that. And so I sometimes think that I think sometimes sometimes I think that um, for and she, by the way, happened to be someone who wanted to to study law. Um, and in one of one part of her portfolio, she had mentioned that she wants to get her um, she wants to go to Harvard Law School because she wants to speak up for those who who cannot do so for themselves. Um, to me, it's obviously a lot about the academic piece of studying law and you know, being able to, 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 um, to, to be a qualified, you know, attorney and, and do that, that part of the job. But it's also a whole different piece where she gets to have that space to figure out and put together her experiences, her ideas, her ideals, and her vision to how she wants the world to be and say, and this, this is the path I'm gonna to take to get there. I believe that people that take the extra time to do this will be more successful and more fulfilling and that they, she wouldn't be someone who's going to get that law degree and get a, you know, a fancy job and, a, and a, maybe a big paycheck um, because she just needed a job. Um, it would be driven by something else. And I think portfolios has that power. And this is something that I would say that when I was at RISD, both as a student and also subsequently taught there, um, I, I felt like that our students we're developing those, but very much so in that discipline. You know, if you're starting to be an architect, you're developing that discipline, you know, disciplinary vision. And in this in instance, though, I think it's not about discipline. She could have done this and then become a social worker. She could have been become a poet. She could have been become a, a writer, a nutritionist. It really didn't matter because her drive comes from something that is very tangible that is in her life. And I think that it's something that is quite interesting. And oftentimes, not we, the students are not given the space to do this. They're not given the space to do this kind of exploration. And um, uh, I would say, personally, when I was a student, um, I was very much in love with architecture. But I, would, I wouldn't lie to you that um, 
it also was because it was okayed by my parents that, you know, they think that, well, you know, you're going to get a job and there's a professional degree and all of that. That was one of the reasons I was allowed to do it. And I was encouraged to do it. And th the fact that I happened to like it was sort of just a bonus. But I would have had to take a job anyway. I would have, because I would have taken a job, I would have gotten a degree anyway. That's kind of how it felt when I went to school. And and I think the students today are different in that they are looking for fulfillment beyond what is expected of them by their parents or even just, you know, sort of, um, you know, by financial, financially driven, you know, sort of incentives. And so I think that this is really interesting. I have another page of hers I want to show. She has a resume page, which I think is um quite lovely because this, by the way, is the typical resume page that you and I, well, most of us here probably think about. Um, you might have a longer resume, have more bullet points and more experience than hers, but the format looks pretty much kind of like that. Um, but if you look at her resume, this looks it looks like this. I just love it. I just love the fact that this is what she's saying. This is what I care about. I wanted to tell you that I did poetry out loud. I'm a participant to that. I did academic decathlon. I'm a participant of that. I see so many students who tells me, I, I don't know what to put in my resume because, you know, I haven't had a proper job yet. Um, and, and when I see this portfolio and this resume page, I always just kind of smile because look, she's not that much older and had that much more experience than your students who, who might be a little bit shy about, you know, the lack of job experience. But look at the, how proud she is of her, herself and her work and her achievements. And here, by the way, she put in some, you know, some of the work that she did as well that, you know, she's proud of. Um, and this is, you know, her, you know, um, drive to doing this legal studies. Um, so, I think that this is um, a wonderful example, and I'm going to move on from here to a slightly different example. The next example I wanted to show is from Stanford University. Um, actually, before I do that, I saw, an, I saw a question um, from Maura. Let me take a quick look. Should I answer, answer the question now? Yeah, that's it, Jeff, if you're up for that, we were going to save it for the Excellent. final Q&A, but if you want to answer it now, that'd be great. No, absolutely. Let me do, take a quick read here. Yeah, the, <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting thing to just think about. Like, how much do we provide for the students so that, um, and I think sometimes you have to go back to sort of the um, sort of root level um, goals that you have for your students. Do you want them to learn? Do you want them to succeed? Do you want them to fail? Do you want them to, um, when I say, do you want them to fail? I really meant it. Do you want them to learn from failing, right? Um, that's that's most of my shorthand of saying so. Um, and, I do believe that sometimes we get slightly too protective. Um, I think that um, people have heard of the terms helicopter parents. Um, and then now I think the new the new term is a snowplow. Was it snowplow parents or something? Right? I'm a parent, I should know. Um, and um, the snowplow plow parents, if that's the correct terminology, refers to parents who clears the road for your, your child so that they will never have to lift their legs up, you know, because it's always going to be flat and beautiful. They will never slip. Um, and I think that if you do that a little bit too much, then really what it really comes down to is that if you do it too much, they don't get to learn from slipping. They don't get to learn from making the wrong decisions. And I think that for us, certainly at RISD, it's a culture building piece. I don't think that, you know, you can just go to a regular classroom and just go, all right, everyone, I put in three words in three random words in the blackboard. And now I want you to action, go. They won't know what you're talking about. That's crazy. 
So I think you have to work yourselves into it. You might be able to build that culture. And if you did, once you have built that culture, so I will give you an example. Like we, uh, one of the things, you know, project that we, I think for many years that our, our 3D classes did was to have the students drop an egg with, you know, it was like limited, I think some high school like science classes do this too, with limited supplies and you're supposed to drop through this four story long, you know, um, four story, you know, sort of um, uh, a stairwell and it's supposed to survive. And almost no one ever does. Um, the egg always break. It's just how spectacularly it does um, and, um, and what you learn from it. And I think that for me, sometimes it's like that, you know, like if you build, you know, create something where they get to do that and, you know, they, they get to, um, they get to, sometimes they just get to fail. That's what they get to do. And through that, through that experience, they get to ask questions in ways that force them out of what, what was normal for them, uh, force them out of the envelope, um, think outside of the envelope. And, and I think that's, that's just, you know, that's just something that I think is important. And, um, it is so difficult when you give people parameters, you know, for every, so in at RISDs, there's something also interesting. We, after you've given people a lot of like a lack of parameter, once you do, then suddenly that becomes like this crazy play piece. So um, our students will step right on the line on whether they should be breaking the rules of, of your, of, of what you've defined for them. And in fact, many of our students will skillfully break the rules, but they know that if they come with a good enough reason, breaking the rules are celebrated. If they didn't come with a good enough reason for breaking the rules, then the project isn't so good. And so for us, that's a, a rather important exercise too, is, how do you develop a culture where the students challenge the rules? They challenge what they were told and they don't take it for granted. I think that's quite important. And so if that, they don't ever get that experience, I think that's, that's a waste of opportunity. And you also think of, you need to think about the long-term impact that you have on them because the more they learn to be really good at complying with your rules, um, the less they are going to be good at challenging them and asking those questions. And certainly if you were to, and I remember hearing, you know, like, let's take something super practical. I think I heard the CEO of Samsung talk about problems that they had. And I think it was in 2008, they made this um, um, uh, interview and he said, well, the problems that we have isn't that we couldn't get skilled workers. The problem that we have is we couldn't get workers that can ask questions that we don't know we have. And if you look at the timeline, that was when Steve Jobs announced um, um, the, um, the iPad, I think. And and whatever, whatever year that was that, you know, Steve Jobs announced the iPad. And I think he basically said, well, I have no, there's no such thing as finding a designer and engineer who's done tablet designs before. There's no majors for that. There still isn't a major for that, right? And, but his worry is we are not trained. Our workers are very skilled engineers. If I give them the problem, they'll solve it. If I tell them you must fit this much battery into this small space, they'll, they'll solve it. But they don't know how to ask questions. They don't know how to challenge that. And, and that's a problem. I think that's a problem for all of us to, to think about. If we don't have that, our society will not advance. It will only take those that are almost like they have to be unusually brave to do so. And do we want to live in that? Or do we want to live in a place where, you know, our students have given ample opportunities so that everyone, it's, think about it as an inclusive, you know, part of education. Everyone has had an opportunity to challenge.
so that they get it ex them that experience under the belt so that in life if they are in a position where they should be challenging something they get to do that they get to be the one who speak up does that make sense so i would think deeply about that but i wouldn't be you know, I wouldn't suddenly go into your curriculum and ax everything, take out all the rules. Plagiarism is okay. Is not. Um, you, 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 you know, you have to be quite smart about it. So, um, but be aware that you, as I like to call, I like to call the faculty members and professors the lead learner in the classroom. You get to be the one who gets to define the first lines of the boundaries, but don't think of it as you know the be it you know uh, 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 the 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 ultimate fact that this is you know how the world needs to be. You need to take up take 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 into the position that it's got to have some flexibility as well. I think that's a good thing and. And for me, um, with our students, it took a lot of experimentations and a lot of um, understanding of when we say you can break the rules, but we need to know a good reason for why you break the rules. We really need to quantify what that means. And sometimes in, in the sort of art and design world, um, we, we use terms like we need to know the rigor of that pro that work, that project. You can go in this direction, but how far did you take it? Did you take it far enough? Did you make it sophisticated enough that it justifies you going in that direction? Does that kind of make sense? Um, I don't know. Does that answer your question, uh, Maura? I think it's Maura that asked the question. Um, it does. Thank you, Jeff. It, it was making me think uh, that concurrently you need to be uh, teaching the students to uh, to question the line, the rules, you know, um, or as they're questioning, they, they have to be developing that rationale. Um, and as you're talking now there at the tail end, the, the rigor, there has to be a rationale for that um, as well. That has to be a piece of it on their minds, you know, right. but, um, but yeah, it's helpful to hear your thoughts. So thank yeah, you. I think, and, and there are some like very basic ground rules too, you know, that I think are built into all of us, you know, they, they may have to do with ethics. They may have to do with, um, they may have to do a lot of like these other unspoken invisible pieces that are already in play. But if you really start to break that down, um, I, I think that it takes a lot of courage to go in and do that. But I think that the results can sometimes be so rewarding that once you start doing it, you will never go back. You just won't because <laughs> you're, you're going to want students to do it. And for us, you know, one of the things that we, you know, that, so, you know, like the critiques that I was talking about before, right? The students are doing this work and we might be talking about this. Um, I remember thinking that one of our professors used to kind of cross the line in my mind, but at the same time, it was such a great learning experience. You know what he would do is he would bring around a roll of tracing paper, like a roll, like a, like a, like a, like a, uh, um, you know, it comes, they come in a roll. It's not a pad. And he walks around with it. And in the critique, such as, you know, this person have post posting these drawings up right here. What he would do is he would come up to the drawing and he will tear out a, a random, you know, like a, like a, 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 like a couple of feet of um, tracing paper. And he has this way of snapping the paper so it makes a clean, clean break. It was one of those like, you know, like trick of the trade, I guess. He would then put it on top of the drawing and he would go, why didn't you do this? Or how about this? And he would draw on top of it, but he doesn't ruin your drawing because he's drawing on the tracing paper and everyone can sort of see it and ponder. And sometimes, you know, that I, I, I remember feeling that when someone didn't have the solution and he's offering a solution, we go, oh no, why did you ruin that? They get, they are the one who's supposed to get the privilege of figuring that out, you know? Good thing you got a solution, but <laughs> it's someone else's chance, right? But 
seeing how they thought through that process, sometimes you're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. I got, I just learned how I might be, I might do this. So I don't feel like that there's a right or wrong in that case, right? But, but even that I'm thinking as a student, like, wow, I was a little bit offended that you gave me my solution. And in fact, almost all the times when teachers do that in our school, in our students, they will stay far away from your solution because they go, yeah, good for you. I now have to come up with a solution that is the exact opposite of yours and still make it work. Now it's more challenging. But um, so that's what they would do. Um, so does that give you sort of a sense of the kind of dynamics that you might encounter? Um, so, so for me, you know, like, it, it's a little bit sort of Socratic, you know, like you always, you know, um, you never provide the answer. You only give them more questions. Sometimes we do that. Um, that's a good way to, you know, sort of stay out of trouble in a way, you know, so that you're not robbing them of their opportunities. Um, so um, I think, um, I think, I think, I think that that's, a, that's our experience. All right. So shall we, you know, move on a little bit? Um, I'm going to show you another example. Now, some of these examples, I won't go into as much depth, um, but I wanted to show you some other versions of what people do. Um, this is another example. It's about Cindy, and and she she was a student. She's graduated since. She was a student at Stanford University, um, and at Stanford University, they have this really wonderful program. Um, it's a notation in science communication, uh, which means that when they graduate, it was too tricky for Stanford to come up with an additional certificate because you know all the registrars, et cetera, couldn't, couldn't agree with all of the terminologies used. However, they were willing to put in a notation in the, in the transcript. And the notation um, as a program is sort of like a certificate program where it was, in this case, this notation is open for all science majors. All science majors, whether you're in computer science or any of the other sciences, et cetera. And it's a very heavy you know, science school in the, in the, um, in, at Stanford. You can take this notation where you have to take a couple of extra classes and you have to, you know, you are sort of going towards not only earning in this case, um, you know, an engineering degree, but also um, having almost like a minor, if you will, in communication, that makes sense. And so in this case for the notation, they came up with this model where the students basically take about three years where they take, I think as a sophomore, they would take a one credit course where they start to think about their portfolios and think about the idea and the concepts of putting something together. And then they work on this a bunch by themselves. Senior year, they have a uh, sort of a capstone two credit course where they ultimately put together a portfolio and sort of gather everything back together and, you know, in the last few years and put together something that is meaningful to them. And so Cindy is an example of that. And what's amazing about this, by the way, is that if I were to show you just 10 different portfolios from the same year, they will all be completely 100% different from each other. They won't even look close to being similar. But what they have common, you know, is that um, students figure out a way to figure out their own narratives. So this person talked about, you know, what they did, you know, experience as a freshman year, et cetera, et cetera. But she sees herself as an engineer, as a pre-med student, but also as a designer. So she has this engineering medicine and design, which is this sort of interesting combination of interest and, and, and abilities and expertise that she had developed over time. And she had done work in all of them. And this is how Cindy sees the world. This is how Cindy sees the world. And I think that this is a wonderful way for people to think about for their portfolio programs is that portfolios could be the lens in which the person's seeing the world and you are just letting them have a space to do that. 
And that in and of itself becomes a really tremendous learning opportunities, regardless of majors, regardless of the disciplines. And if you are in whatever discipline that you're in and you can support that, that's even better, right? And so some of the things that Cindy would do would include, you know, she has this, I know she's very technical and she has a whole project on machine learning, trying to figure out large amount of data, how to process that. And so she took fMRI data um, and, um, uh, and try to identify if there are patterns that can tell whether you know someone is um, has excessive uh, ex is an excessive alcohol drinker, and so she talked about that, and she might do a little reflection on what that means. She might post a paper of it, and then talk about how what experience you know the, you know she actually drew experience from her research poster before and other papers, etc. That came to this you know point. Does that make sense? And so I think this is a really interesting portfolio in which you get to see this web of who Cindy is and how this person came to be. Um, so I think that's very beautiful. And then another one here on um, you know, the problem with opioids, but you will see that in this particular case, she's talking about big data visualization techniques but she's also thinking about design. She's thinking about how do I use my skills of being able to understand these highly technical um, information and present it in a way that um, anyone can understand. Um, and so, um, and so, this is um, part of what that you know, you know who who she is. And then another one that is similar too, you know, on you know additional sort of infographics, etc. And um, and you will see, you know, she might have presentations, et cetera, on, 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 on the topic. I think that these are interesting ways for people to think about portfolios. In some sense, when you look at these, and I know that someone had talked about assessment before, and I've done, I've done a fair bit of assessment and accreditation work myself and, and, um, and also with you know with other you know with other institutions, and sometimes you know looking at something someone like Cindy and you go wow how how the heck do I do that quantitative literacy um, um, assessment? Um, and maybe in this case it's really easy because she sort of fed it <laughs> you know to us you know with her quantitative literacy. But what about those other outcomes that we may have in mind? It doesn't say quantitative literacy anywhere. You know, we have to go find them. I have to go in and read it and then decipher and say, oh, she literally had to understand the literature in, in numbers to come up with this way of expressing herself, right? So you can make that connection, but sometimes it's not easy to make that connection with that assessment. And sometimes people get a little bit um, worried or sometimes even um, frustrated that, well, why wouldn't we just ask Cindy to make her portfolio have a whole page called quantitative literacy so that we'll just have her put all of her quantitative literacy work there and then we're done. Well, in some ways it is, you know, they would have, that would have made your work really, really easy. But I would argue that if she had done that, she wouldn't have been able to express herself in this way to make the connection between this project and the last and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So I think the net, the net result is that it might have saved you some time, but Cindy might have had a less good experience as a learner. She might have gotten less far. And just to Think about the, again, the sort of the net benefit for everyone here. It would have meant that Cindy would have gotten less far as a learner, possibly. It would have also meant that, yes, it would have been easier for you to put everything into one page and assess it. But because she had gotten less far, you would have achieved a little bit less, let's say in your rubric. 
in defining what quantitative literacy might be. Does that kind of make sense? So the net result is that you are not really able to assess your students' best selves. So to me, as an educator, I maintain the position that we must, we must prioritize our students' sort of well-being and ability to express their, their best selves, the ability to achieve the most as our top priority as educators. Because if we are willing to let that slip and let that go, it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. And then you're you know, suddenly being able, well, when, why don't we cut this corner and that corner as well, right? And this is where we can get into a situation where the students are not engaged. These students are so super engaged. My students are really so engaged. They, they, they're staying up three, four nights a week to do their work. And it's, it's unbelievable what they would do. And so um, sort of a lack of engagement was never our problem. It was never, well, I can't say I wasn't Cindy's professor, but it wasn't Cindy's problem either um, from the look of it. And so, so I think that that's something to, you, you are always making these trades. You, you know, you, you, you make it a little bit, perhaps if it was all just one way, it was just easy for you. Well, you know, you're now seeing a little less engagement from them. And little by little, you are gonna start to, you know, it's a slippery slope. It's gonna start pushing further and further down the line until you don't recognize it. So I think it's dangerous and I'd be careful about that. Now, but in education, I mean, I'm not going to go into the, the, the technical piece of it in this in this session, but the idea in education is that actually we did figure out how to make, you know, this page and some of these other pages to, you know, to correlate with uh, quantitative literacy because we have this ability in our assessment system to align these things no matter where they come from. You see what I mean? So in our case, we've actually solved that by creating a system that allows you to map this work into the different outcomes. And therefore, how they did it didn't matter. Cindy didn't have to come up with a, a, a particular you know, format in order to achieve exactly what you wanted. Okay. And so I would say once, you know, I'm, I'm sure Gretchen and her team, and I think, was it J uh, Jamie? Um, who's who's going to be um, um, taking over the work, and his team uh, will, I'm sure, no doubt, you know, show you how to do that effectively. All right, so I'm going to go a little bit quicker now because I I do have a couple of uh, uh, really different type of portfolios I want you to see because I I don't want you to come away with this thinking that portfolios has to be about all of Amanda and all of Cindy. It could also be about a trip that this person has. So this person is from Cornell, Casey is from Cornell, and you can read a little bit about her here, but her entire portfolio is more or less about this internship and study abroad experience that she had. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to be all about her. It doesn't have to be including everything that she had ever done. And in fact, in digication, um, something that you may or may not know is that you can create one or more portfolios. You can have unlimited number of portfolios. Some people get scared by that. They go, well, how do you manage it? In some ways, how do you manage the files on your computer? How do you manage all of the emails that you have? Well, they, you kind of manage because you know that there are multiples of them and you figure out a way to do it. And education is not that different. You can see in one space, all the portfolios that you have and they're titled and you can click on them and get to them. So the, the technical part of it, the logistical part of it is not that difficult. But if you are willing to let that go a little bit, you know, sort of cognitively start, start to think, well, could they have one or more portfolios? What you're gonna start to see is, well, this particular portfolio may mean something really different for her, for Casey, than the one that she might have that is all about Casey. Does that make sense? And the, the way that they are going to express themselves might be different too. So this student, you know, um, for all that week of travel or the multiple weeks of travel had all of these different reflections that she might have. Um, and 
And that is just fine. And that's exactly what she needs out of this experience. She might look back at this portfolio, not one for the purpose of potentially getting a job or applying to graduate school, but it may be just a, um, it could well be that this travel experience was very meaningful for her. And these, ex these reflections is what she draw inspirations from as she goes and do her next thing. Does that make sense? And, and I think that you, you, you have to be a little bit open-minded about, you know, the purpose of some of these portfolios. It doesn't have to be about their best and curated work either. It could be work in progress just as much. And I think that when you think about that, um, in digication, by the way, you also have the ability to quite easily drag and drop pages and content from one page to another and make copies. But because of that feature, because of that ability for you to do that, it frees you know, Casey from having the ability to do this portfolio like this. And if she ever wanted to have a portfolio you know, about just her, about some other aspect of her work, she could quite easily come back into week two and say, this is a really fabulous ex exercise. I'm going to drag this and make a copy of this to my other portfolio. Does that make sense? And they can do that very easily. So it allows you to recontextualize things um, by just doing that. It by and 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 that allows you and hopefully encourage you to have a little bit more free form sort of um, idea on how portfolios might be structured. Um, and I'll show a couple of examples that really highlights that. This is an example at DePaul University. This is a student who I really love this portfolio. He spent his um, um, senior year uh, for his capstone senior project um, on creating this portfolio, which is all about the um, all about the lack of um, uh, black representation in the judicial system in in the state of Illinois, and the effect of that and the and the status of that, and so he more or less had become probably the de facto expert in the subject. I remember talking to his professor and his professor said, yeah, he probably is the you know, um, world's one of the leading experts in this particular subject. He spent a whole year studying this and he was obsessed, obsessed about, um, about that. And so um, I, I, um, I know that in, um, in, uh, in, in his portfolio, by the way, if you um, were to look through this portfolio, it actually is not about him at all. His name is Jack uh, um, O'Neill. Um, the portfolio has very little to do with him. It actually has everything to do with this subject that he cares so, so deeply about. And so if I were to click through the portfolios, you know, there's, you know, like a lot of, you know, visuals, there is a lot of interviews, there's a lot of essays and, 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 and research on the topic. And one of the, um, one of the, um, uh, one of the things that um, uh, was really, I thought really amazing about this is that this particular student um, I, I happened, you know, I was very lucky to have met him afterwards, after the fact. He graduated in 2019, and um, after he graduated, he became uh, the digital media director for the Illinois um, Democratic Senate, um, and, uh, and, uh, and he ended up working on the general election, which was one of his, you know, his his uh, his dream. He was a political science major, um, and uh, he was able to work with all kinds of um, help, all kinds of people, and and uh, with their elections, and um, and, uh, and 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 was really really happy about that. And I when I talked to him, when I learned about this, and he he also said to me that, um, you know, it it might well be because of the portfolio that. Um, when he was hired, he didn't get hired as a as a uh, as an intern into into the into the Senate, but as a digital media director, and 
and much of it may have a lot to do with the fact that um, she, um, um, he has, um, he was able to show this work, and that the work um, really sort of spoke for itself, and and um, and 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 had, um, and had uh, 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 shown the, the 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 his employer that he was ready to do the work. He he wasn't just you know um, he's 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 capable. He has the ability, and that the work is good enough for that. And so you know he landed the job. Um, so I think that's it's pretty amazing to see that. Um, and um, and many people actually talk about um, sort of what do you show to the world and how public do you make your portfolio? And this person, you know, made this portfolio public like this because he um, shared, he, he wants to share this as a resource to the world. He wants the world to understand, you know, this, um, this research that he had done similar to this person who um, um, you know did a similar in a similar course um, had uh, uh, created a whole project about black arts in um, in uh, in the south side of Chicago and after he she had finished um, uh, this pro project she actually also um, she also was able to um, get an, uh, this amazing job at, at the Equal Justice Initiative, which is um, this law firm that um, um, specialize in helping people who are wrongfully put on death row in uh, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Um, so this becomes, becomes resource as much as it is about her portfolio. So, and it is about that resource, about the work itself that actually got her to success. Um, and having that said, I did want to sort of maybe perhaps go back to, um, um, I see that, um, uh, Gretchen, um, uh, you know, you have, um, made a reminder here that, uh, we might want to have some time to, to, um, to talk and talk about, uh, to talk about, uh, to answer some questions. Um, so I think this might be a good time to pause and do that, um, by the way, I am happy to share with you the portfolio links um, that I shared today afterwards, and I will share that with Gretchen. And you know, Gretchen, please feel free to distribute that. Um, the only thing that I cannot share is the first portfolio by Amanda. This portfolio is actually uh, password protected. She had explicitly granted me rights to share this because it does have some um, sensitive information in this portfolio. Um, but so she does not keep this public, but she has granted me rights to use this as, um, uh, uh, um, as um, to tell her story and to, uh, to illustrate, you know, the way that, you know, she had used um, uh, portfolios in her career. Um, so um, I'd be happy to share that and maybe even some additional ones that, you know, that we may not have time for. Um, but like, again, again, this one, you know, this is the only one that we, I will not be sharing with you. Okay, so um, um, questions? So Jeff, uh, as people are starting to think about their questions and, and adding them to the chat, uh, I've got one or two that I can send your way. Okay. Uh, first of all, can you tell me how does the level of, first of all, I, I love the idea of the, the studio-based pedagogy. So really appreciate sharing that, all the examples, all the principles behind it, it was really powerful ideas. Um, how would you say the level of students, say from freshman to PhD, impacts mm -hmm. how you implement that studio-based pedagogy? Um, I think that it's a really, really good question. And um, so first of all, I would answer the, the, the more obvious question first, which is, can a freshman do it? Um, not just how you do it. And can a kindergartner do it? Um, not just what, how to do it. And the answer is yes. I think that it is not true that you must be, you must have all these basics. You must have learned all the basic skills. Now you've, you've, you've learned all this stuff. Now you earn the rights to be creative, right? So um, I have um, three teenagers and two that are, I have also a five and a six year old. And having seen all of their growth patterns, um, 
look, my five and six year olds, um, you know, they would do projects today, you know, right? I'll sit them on a the table, they'll, they'll break all the rules. They'll do all the things that, that, that I talked about that looks like a studio-based pedagogy, by the way, right? Um, so I think that the question is you, you certainly need to address, some of it is a, a skill-based need, right? So give you an example, there is this um, amazing K-12 school that used portfolios from K through 12. So kindergarten on up. So I asked them how to do it. And I actually went to their classroom and they showed me um, this kindergartner's portfolio. The kindergartner's portfolio obviously is private, so I can't share it. It would have been amazing to share it because it's so amazing. You would be just so inspired. Is that the students, they didn't know how to write. They don't know how to spell. They don't know how to type, right? But you know what they know how to do? They know how to go onto that add video button and then click on it and record. So they just talk about what they learned, right? So they talk about what they learned, they talk about things, they have discussions with people and they just recorded it. That became their portfolio. And so I, I think that, so on one hand, like talk about basic skills, these students couldn't write at all. They couldn't spell at all, right? And so they were able to do that. And so if you then scale to, you know, your freshman students, you know, um, obviously a little bit more um, applicable here, I would say just because you feel like that they haven't had their, you know, basic, you know, sort of skills, maybe go back to my uh, an, um, earlier version of going to that history class, the teacher gave us a bag of evidence and say, come up with, you know, try to figure out what happened, right? Um, it didn't, just because we weren't historians, we're professional historians, we didn't have a PhD, or we weren't, um, we also didn't know, we weren't detectives, and we weren't, um, we weren't, um, you know, interrogators, um, but we, we still figure stuff out, right? And so I think that, um, I think that sometimes, um, um, the ability to present the context is one thing. The ability to figure out that skill level and use that as a way to also not only experience it, but to also develop skills. So a lot of people think that skill development must only happen like separately from, from the fun part of the work. Sometimes it's doing the fun part of work where you develop the skills. Um, and so if you can do that, you actually save you a big bunch of time, save your students a big a lot of hassle. And then also in the outcomes, um, part of it, you know, obviously for your PhD students, you know, you expect some pretty um, sophisticated way, you know, sp sophisticated outcomes. I don't want to say that you will lower the bar for your students, you know, that are not a PhD, but I would, I would just make sure that you understand the context. Context is everything. Um, so you have to understand the context um, and that context gives you, gives you, I think, um, uh, uh, gives you, it can be, you can use it as a guide for yourselves. Um, and by the way, what I find is that when the students and some of part of the studio-based pedagogy I didn't talk about is the fact that during the critiques, they get to learn from each other, which is a really big part because in a studio environment, one thing that they, it's open-ended is that every work is almost by default <laughs> visible to everyone. And throughout the semester, you've presented it so many times to each other that by the end, we always joke that we could have swapped project and I could just present for someone I know I would know. Um, because we would have known all of this stuff. And what's really actually really cool about that model is that you ultimately sort of like Jack, you know, the, the person who did the, who became in the, in the work for the Senate might have become an expert in this one area. And, and actually Michaela Clark, who's you know, one of his classmates who did this project, would have also seen enough of Jack's project that even though she was not an expert in the judicial system, you know, or lack of black prosecutors in that system, she would have known it enough that 
that she would have you know learned quite a lot from it and so for us in that studio based in environment remember i said we don't have a curriculum because we we just there are too many topics to this to to try to address what we do is we use themselves as ways to address these questions with each other so that if there are 15 people there's likely 15 different topics being explored and yet they learn so much from each other that you become the expert at one but you also become pretty good at the other 14 things does that make sense and that's another piece that you can really sort of they have to work in concert all right so i see that melissa has a question yes school this is how it encourages creative for school but i'll take it with them but to what end Yes, very good question. And of course, one big part of it has to do with, you know, a lot of students will be thinking about jobs, will be thinking about graduate schools, and portfolios often becomes a thing for them. I, I really think that um, jobs and um, graduate schools, to me, lies on the extrinsic motivation part of motivation. And many of you probably have heard, you know, the intrinsic parts are usually much more powerful. So when you can get someone passionate about something such as Michaela here, passionate about, you know, black arts, I, I didn't get to show this one, but this is a student in John Jay, who, um, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, who started a queer mentorship program. Um, and it's a portfolio. She, it was not part of a class at all. It has, in fact, nothing to do with any academic studies or uh, at the time, a course that she had taken during COVID. Uh, he had taken during COVID. He uh, had a student named Sam Asancio. And Sam had found that Sam is a, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is a, uh, a student, I think it's called a student mentor um, at, at the school already. Um, he is a trans student who is very active in the LGBTQ plus community, and she decided to start a mentor mentorship program for other LGBTQ students, um, and it was a really important thing, and so he did that, started this whole program, ultimately actually got this program funded so that all of the advisors, the student mentors, actually um, actually got paid for being mentors to other students, um, and um, and now... What's amazing about this is that Sam's program was so um, was was successful enough that other institutions has now invited Sam to go in and start their own um, program, um, uh, start chapters of his program in the, on the other campuses, um, and so he has almost sort of accidentally created a job for himself. Isn't that interesting? Um, and so um, and so um, these things could happen, but but if you look at this, is so much to do with a much more intrinsic way of thinking, like for him. It's about the world doesn't have this, it needs to have it. I, I visualize that and I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make it happen. Um, and so the way that you can maybe get students to do that, by the way, um, the way that you would get students to do that will has a lot to do with the culture that you build for your students. The more that you are having them do stuff for you as opposed to for them, then the more, the less you are, they're going to do things intrinsically. The more you're able to get them to do things for them, then the more it, intrinsic pieces, you know, come in. Now, having that said, a lot of people will have that very practical, what about the extrinsic stuff? Getting a job is important, by the way. Um, and actually, there are a lot of people that do that as well. And one thing that I would just uh, advise you to maybe open up the mind of your for students a little bit, and this go back, by the way, interestingly, to not having one single portfolio. So a lot of people think I will just have this one portfolio, have all my work in it. Everyone's going to love it. They're going to hire me. They're going to love me. And be that as it may, imagine that this is one of my students, some of my students would do. So I'll give you an example of one of my students that really taught this to me, which was he. he's a really good student, has a fantastic body of work. And he showed me um, two, like three versions of his portfolio, all for the purpose of career building, okay? One of which is sort of a generic career portfolio. The other one was for um, a specific job 
that he wanted, which was for uh, uh, interior, you know, architecture in New York City, and one is for a sustainable architecture company in, you know, in Oregon or in the West Coast somewhere. And those three portfolios are really dramatically different because he highlighted different things. Um, and just for folks that are super practical and just trying to get ahead, um, having the portfolios for that purpose, again, if it's for them, then it becomes intrinsic and they will find creative ways of doing so. And that hopefully get, gets them a little bit further into doing things outside of that classroom. Does that make sense? I know that we're coming close to the time. Oh, um, I have a question from David. What resources would you recommend to learn about studio-based pedagogy? Uh, I wish that I have something really solid that I can give you. So at this art and design school, we it feels a lot like we know a lot about what we do, but we don't really write it down. We don't really tell people and we don't document it very well. Um, I think that uh, the book that I had mentioned before and I'm going to see if I can put a link. And if I if I don't find it right now, I'll share that with Gretchen afterwards. And actually, I'll just share it with Gretchen afterwards, and maybe you can take a look at it. Um, it's a um, it's a book that is not a manual on how to do things, just like our style. But it's a it's a book on a number of different professors documenting their own experiences. And from that, hopefully, you can learn a little bit about what what they do. But good question, David. Um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Kate, is it this? <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. The the write the writing workshops is it's uh, it's I like I said, I think a lot of people in the arts, you know, really um um hopefully, you know, um echo a lot of the things that we do. Um I think that sometimes is it's important for us to take the context. Um, sometimes it's just sort of almost like say, I'm gonna ignore what I do for a minute. I'm just gonna to wanna to see what other people do and take that context and try to study it. And sometimes you can map back at what you do and come up with really tremendously you know, innovative things that, that you just never thought of before. And I think that's a lot of what artists do. They observe and then they try to see the world in a certain way. And I think that in your case, in your creative uh, nonfiction program, I'm sure that that's what they do as well. Um, and so there's a lot of truth to, to that. Um, and, and it it hopefully rings true to the pedagogy as it translates into you know all the way to you know how you structure your course, how you talk to your students, and so on and so forth. Yeah, Kate, um, we can. Uh, I was just gonna say, Kate, we can work to get you some additional examples. I did. I I hate to to break in because this is such a rich um, conversation, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. And I really want to express um, our gratitude to you, Jeff, not only for doing this presentation, but, but for all the support and help you've given us as we made the decision to move towards education and as we're beginning to implement. And it's, uh, it's a big process. It's a long process. It's an exciting process. And you've just been such an amazing resource for us. So I just wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to you for just everything that you have done for us. Um, so um, everyone, if you could join me in, in thanking um, Jeff for this presentation today. Um, thank, thank you all so much for inviting me. And it's, it's been a true pleasure to work with you, Gretchen. I, I, for those who you know, don't know, Gretchen and her team are just absolute, absolutely top notch. And I think you, you know, um, I, I, I felt very, very fortunate and privileged to be able to work with you too. Thank you so much. Uh, and Jamie, Jamie is going to be um, your your um, he's going to be a wonderful resource for you as well, and a wonderful partner for you as well. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I will share the recording of this presentation. Please reach out to me, to Jamie, to Dave if you have questions. Um, we are just about to announce that we have a hands-on training that we're about um, to to um, schedule for faculty. So lots of good things about education in the works. So good night, everyone, and thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Enjoy and have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.